automated technologies are impacting public space in a huge number of ways. We have sensors embedded all through the cities that we live and move through. We have drones taking off in the sky above us to deliver urgent medical supplies, but also to drop sushi at your door in less than six minutes. But what we don't have is a good sense of what the actual impacts of those technologies will be. And unless we get a deep understanding of those transformations of space, we're going to be left behind. Our project is about digging below the surface of what technology companies are doing and the changes to regulation and asking like, well, what do these transformations mean? And what does it mean for really vital things like people's capacity to protest or to undertake civic action when we don't like the choices that government or other actors are making on our behalf? This automation of public and shared space isn't entirely new. It depends on a long process of embedding more and more sensors into cities, into natural environments, into agriculture. So part of the challenge for us is working out, well, how do the longer histories play out now and how are they being transformed in the new environment that we're in today? We're really honing in on three particular case studies because we think they show us very different things about the automation of public space, but also work together in some really resonant and important ways. One case study we're investigating is drone delivery. I am a Lauren Technology Scholar. I've been thinking about uh, the governance of automated decision making, and in particular, I've been focusing on how the sort of idea of drone deliveries as a commercial product necessitates a great deal of what we might call regulatory modernization. When we talk about drone delivery, we're talking about the transformation of urban skies into spaces that can be easily navigated by autonomous drones. This means there's a traffic management system in place, that there are no obstacles in place that can hinder or obstruct delivery, and that environments that were once free and available for use by a range of actors, kids flying kites, birds in the skies, are now being subjected to private use by commercial actors who want to extract value from those public spaces. There have been these reports from big consultancies that have identified billions of dollars of value that just exists in the sky in our public space. So as this whole environment evolves, no one's quite sure yet where the sort of value propositions are, but all this experimentation is about um, finding ways to access that value. A lot of the research on this space is looking at drone delivery as a really speculative technology, things that might exist, that might come into fruition. Where my research is different is because I'm looking at where trials are currently being undertaken in places in Australia and to look at why is Australia being chosen as a testbed site of all the places it could be trialled. At the moment, Australia is actually quite advanced in terms of um, adjusting its regulatory environment to facilitate passenger drones and delivery drones. Aviation is historically extremely safe. And one of the reasons it's very safe is that the sort of aviation system safety people really like um, determinative outcomes. They really like to be able to test everything and know exactly what's gonna happen. Delivery drones and pilotless passenger drones kind of break this mold because they involve machine learning systems. Right, which are non-determinative. Our aviation safety regulator called CASA has accepted these various standards with respect to the risk presented by different aviation technologies. And with these standards, it means that if companies can come and show that they satisfy these standards, that they comply with the uh, ways to deal with the various types of risk that their technologies produce, then CASA is allowing them to operate in certain circumstances. And that's not happening in other places around the world. So one of the more interesting things we've found that despite all the criticisms of drones, that a lot of people do value drones, but that's only because of the failures in other parts of their lives. So for example, in somewhere like Logan, where the traffic is really bad, there's really poor public transport. One might say that that's really good, you know, to have a solution for someone who maybe doesn't have a car and can't take an hour to get on the bus. 
But on the other hand, we could say that having a commercial actor invested in you having bad infrastructure and having bad public transport is bad for the community more broadly. So there are bigger issues to look at that are more than just does the technology work or not? Is it a successful trial or not? But what are the long-term issues that might come around? Defence has its priorities, industry has its priorities, our aviation regulators have their priorities and we also have communities to consider. So what's happening now is this sort of big experimental process. Another area we're investigating is automated technologies of crowd control and crowd management, which can apply to closed spaces like stadiums, but also to civic protest and particularly policing. Crowd control technologies uh, are positioned as a smooth and frictionless solution to the problem of the crowd. And this is really important for us to consider because these technologies are so quickly emerging that they're quite under-regulated. So we don't yet understand the full implications of what these technologies mean for surveillance, for privacy, and of course, these democratic ideals that are very core to the society we live in, like the freedom of assembly and the right to protest. So I think one way we can think about um, automated crowd control is by thinking about predictive policing tools. These tools use existing crime data to map the city and to predict crime hotspots. We're talking about the use of artificial intelligence technologies and machine learning technologies to monitor, control and regulate crowds in spaces which include things like biometric recognition, um, intelligent processing of live video feeds, um, affect analysis, and many more things. But one of the things that remains sort of um, a problem with these tools is that they are drawing on existing police data that might in the first instance contain already um, discriminatory bias, like racial bias. So when these things are fed into automated systems, they tend to reproduce the existing bias that's there. That poses a really significant problem because these tools are often presented to us as if they are objective and neutral and apolitical solutions to complex social problems. So we're seeing these increasingly taken up. The speed at which it's increasing really calls into question how urgent it is for us to study these things critically and study them now. We're also investigating digital twins, or virtual representations of physical environments and processes. When we talk about digital twins, we're talking about real world objects or processes or environments and their twinning or relationship through sensor systems to virtual or digital representations of those systems. And so what might be interesting to think about in this twinning environment is that there's a kind of feedback loop of information and governance going on between these two sides, the real and the virtual. Our research on digital twins has extended to objects like the European Union's Digital Twin of the Ocean project and it's really interesting and important to understand because it sheds light on how decisions get made about climate, it might shed light on how trade-offs are being experienced by coastal communities having to deal with both climate considerations and economic considerations and it might tell us quite a bit about what's happening both below the surface and above the surface in terms of the computational arrangements that are actually governing how ships move, how fish are tracked, how coastal communities engage with governments. A lot of the research on digital twins so far has really been um, undertaken at a computer science level, at an industrial level, and in some kind of public policy circles. But the social science and humanities have really only started to look at how objects like the digital twin work in the world and on society at large. Our project is working towards building conceptual frameworks that will help us understand the cultural, social, ecological, and economic impacts of digital twins. We think this research is really important because it's beginning to build some transparency around some of the hidden systems that govern everyday life and space. So why is it important to take into consideration public space when we're thinking about automated decision-making technologies? One of the ways that um, automated decision-making is interacting with our lives 
more and more is in a very sort of material way. We've spent a lot of time thinking about software as like something that exists on a computer, but increasingly these technologies are spatialized. Our mobile phones have connections to geographic information systems. The management of public space has become a priority of commercial operators like digital platforms who now mediate our engagement with public space. So if you want to go to a, find a restaurant, you look on Google Maps and this creates all kinds of opportunities for those companies who do this kind of automated decision making to condition our experience of the space around us. One of our key objectives in the Automated Space Project is to develop a deeper understanding that can drive scholarship forward. Advancing knowledge in this way is really crucial to getting a deeper understanding of um, society and culture and the impacts of technology. But we don't want to just stop there. Policymakers need to be more informed about the impacts of transformations of regulation. They need to listen to um, a wider set of voices, not just ours, but also the affected communities. And that's an important part of the role that we can play. And those communities deserve a deeper understanding of the impacts of automation on the spaces that they live in and that they move through in their daily lives. And so it's important for us to create different methods of communication that will um, get out to communities and be accessible to them as well.